Hi, my name is Noah Gift, and today I'm going to walk you through how to start from absolutely zero a function and build it into a series of command line tools using both Python Click and Python Fire, building out a library structure, and then eventually containerizing it, pushing it into the cloud, and then deploying continuous delivery of a containerized microservice. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. The first thing I'm going to do here is uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, create a new repository so that you can see the artifacts that we create and you can, as I have each checkpoint, uh, you can you can get a copy of, of the checkpoint. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new re repository right here and we'll call this, um, call this functions from zero and uh, we'll, 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 we'll say, uh, uh, live training like this and one of the things I would recommend whenever you're creating a github repository for Python is to do two things essentially make a readme file and add a git ignore file and in this case the git ignore file gives us uh, Python and then I can go ahead and, and create a repository and there, there's really now that we've got this basic repository there's a couple different flavors of of, of writing code in a web browser to bring up, uh, especially again for like this kind of style of coding. One is uh, a Jupyter notebook or a, or a Colab notebook, and another one is some kind of a web-based development environment. Uh, and O'Reilly actually has a lot of really uh, um, great uh, web-based development environments uh, that that you can use with the Katacoda system. In my case, though, I'm gonna I'm gonna use two different systems. I'm going to use either uh, GitHub Code Spaces or I'm going to use Colab Notebook. So I'm now that I've got this repository, I'm going to I'm going to toggle over to uh, the uh, GitHub Code Spaces here, and let's actually <clears throat> switch over to it. I'm going to type in Colab, and what's nice about Colab is that it's a great environment to to kind of go through and build out. A, a function and as I build out these functions and statements in Python I can also uh, check checkpoint that into this repository uh, that I that I created and so that's really what we're gonna do we're gonna we're gonna go through here and and use this system uh, to to do that so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, swap this screen here so we have a beginning screen here and at the beginning of a notebook this is where I would keep the notes, and, and we'll just call this uh, statements right here at the top. And this would just be a file to keep track of. And uh, what's great about this Colab notebook environment, we won't go into too much detail about it, but it, you can think of it as like a, essentially like a Microsoft Word document or a Google Doc, but for code. And so you can do a combination of keeping notes. So as you're learning Python, for example, you can keep notes here. So I'm gonna go ahead and click connect to, to connect to it. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to create a text cell and put this above here. And we could just say, you know, our notes, right? Okay, I'm gonna put two hashtags to create a, a structure here and say, you know, uh, learning, learning statements. There we go. And then once I've got this set up, I can just go through and step by step put whatever it is I want to want to do. So the traditional way in Python to learn statements would be to start with the hello world. And let's go ahead and and uh, stay with the, the tradition in Python. It's very straightforward to print a uh, hello world. You just use a print statement and put inside of that bracket a string. In this case, we say hello world. Uh, and so that's really the essence of a statement in Python is you have some either a variable or a function or some uh, component of the programming language and you execute it and you get you, you get your feedback. Now, you can also do this in a terminal as well. Uh, if we went to a terminal, you could see that very similar things happen. My recommendation would be some kind of Jupyter uh, programming environment like Colab, which is which is a free service or Jupyter or or some some service where you have a notebook is I think one of the best ways to learn Python because of the interactive nature of it. So that's the hello world, but what if what if we want to build out more things other than just a hello world? 
what are some of the core things to, to remember for statements? Well, I think the first thing would probably be variables. And so we can do the same thing. We can add a little note here uh, underneath and put this uh, cell block here and we can say, you know, variables. <coughs> I'm gonna go ahead and uh, edit this cell. There we go. And we'll say three, three hashtags, so it's below here variables and what is a variable well we can just literally call it variable and put a, a value and assign to it that's it right <clears throat> and as i mentioned earlier uh so that if you wanted to play around with this notebook as i finish each of them uh, I'll, I'll do a checkpoint and check it in for you but to get started with just so you get a little bit of of a, a snippet of code i'm going to check this in so you can get a copy so we'll say file save a copy in GitHub, and I'm gonna find that new repo that I just created, and I'm gonna check it into there. So we'll go ahead and say GitHub, here we go. And we, and we say uh, functions here. I'm gonna to try to find the one that I just built, functions from zero. So we're, we need to find a, a repo here called functions from zero that I just created, and I'll check it in. and functions from zero there we go and I'll, i might as well just show you this round trip because it is kind of a neat little round trip is that once once you check that in then you at home can actually go through and play around with this so i'll, I'll go ahead and put this into a chat so you can get access to it here we go and Perfect. There we go. So essentially what's what's really nice about this feedback loop uh, at the very beginning here is that you, you can, first of all, visually look at what I wrote, uh, but you also can just click this button. And uh, if you have access to the Colab environment, boom, we're back, right? And so you, you can play around with your own version of this and keep notes. So in my opinion, again, one of the most valuable way to, to learn Python. So we're, we're back here. I'm gonna connect back again. You saw the feedback loop. So what is the point of a variable here? Why are we doing this? Well, really the idea here is that you need to store things so that you can loop over them or you know, keep status of uh, some data you pull from a database or you know, whatever it is you want to, to do something with. You need to keep it somewhere. That's what a variable is, is used for. A good example would be uh, the classic kind of math problem, right? If I wanted to uh, go through here and uh, do a x uh, is equal to 1 and then uh, go ahead and uh, put a, 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 a statement below here and say y is equal to 2 like this. Uh, I could then use those two things together and do, do a, uh, a math problem, right? I could say x plus y and we could see what happens, 3. Right, one and two is equal to three. So that's that's really it. I mean, it's just a place to store things. So, uh, what are the what are the components uh, of building building logic out in Python? First, got to be able to state write a statement. Second, you got to be able to do some uh, variables here. Now, what else what else can we do? Well, the next thing that I would uh, do is we need to be able to store things other than just a variable. We need like a a, a more uh, sophisticated container, and so. You could think of maybe a variable in a way like you go to the grocery store and you don't use a cart or a basket. You just walk in, grab some, you know, I don't know, some apples and then go, go through. You can only store so much. You need to have some kind of a container in order to, to carry other things. So in this example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build uh, one more and we'll call this uh, data structures. And these, these are the things that we need to use in Python so that we can actually store uh, more than just one thing. And so a list would be the first thing that I would uh, start with. And a list, uh, the way it works is, we could call this my list, is it just holds uh, a, a sequence of things. So I could put in here one, two, three. And then once I've got this in the list, I can do things with this list like, for example, say zero. There you go, my list, and I can say I wanna grab the first thing in the list. In Python, 
the lists are ordered from zero uh, you know, to each incremental number. And so if I wanted to grab the next thing in the list, I would go through here and I would say my list and I would grab the next thing. And you can see that now, now that grabbed uh, number two. Uh, and then if I go through and I say my list and I can actually tab complete, that's one of the nice things about this collab environment. We can go through here and we can say, okay, let's grab the last thing and the list, right? So it's nice because it allows me again, just like a basket in a supermarket, I can put more stuff in there, you know, and kind of pull it out and, you know, change things around. I think it's a very similar concept. So let's even add a little note there underneath here and we can say lists, right? So that gives us uh, something useful. One thing I'll point out too about this thing that I'm building for you is if we go to this tab in the left, notice it builds a nice uh, hierarchy. So this is a great way for you to learn is, is again, in my opinion, you create a hierarchy inside of uh, a notebook like this and then you keep your own personal study notes. And so again, I'll just uh, be nice here, save a little checkpoint for you uh, and so you can see a copy of it as I'm, as I'm building it. We'll wait, we'll wait for this thing. There we go. Functions from zero. It remembered it. That's nice. It threw, it went through and made a copy. So we got lists here. Okay. Well, that's nice. But what, what else can we do? Well, we also have data structures, uh, called dictionaries in Python. Let's go ahead and create that. So I'll go through here and, uh, create a dictionary and dictionaries are a little more sophisticated. And I would say probably the most common form of uh, a data structure in Python it, because they're, they're so flexible. Uh, a list, you only put things into it and pull them out. In a dictionary, you can do uh, key value exchanges. And so uh, uh, how would you create a dictionary? So we'll, we'll go ahead and, and we'll say my dict right here. And I'll go ahead and put this inside and we'll say uh, one and we can do one, right? And then if I do two we can do two just like this and then at this point uh, i have a dictionary how do i know it's a dictionary one thing you can do in python that's really helpful is you can use the word type in this case if i do type like this i do my dict notice it tells me that it's a dictionary so same thing if i go up here and i want to look at what the type is for uh, a list i would just go through here and say my my list, just like that. There we go, and we can see it's we can see it's a list. Now, what can you do with a dictionary? How, why is it so so interesting? Well, the, the the key components of a dictionary is you have a key and you have a value. So in this case, we'll go through here and we'll say my dict dot keys, just like this. And now you can see I have a one and a two right inside of there, uh, which are the, the the two keys. And if I have uh, values, if I say my dict dot values there we go through here we we can see there's a one and a two as a value so we've got a lot of um, ways to access the dictionary the keys and values is one way another way that a, a commonly people will do is they'll also loop over a, a dictionary you also can loop over a uh, a list as well so let's go ahead and uh, do that next let's start to pull stuff out programmatically and i'm going to build a loop so go through here and we'll say, okay, let's, let's build some loops. And really a loop is a control structure. So once you start to get up and, and you, and you go through, uh, you know, building out these data structures, the most common thing is, okay, well, what do I do? I need to start pulling stuff out. So you need some kind of control flow. And in this particular example here, what we can do is we can just say for uh, key value, that's like a kind of a common, uh, way of, of putting a loop variable, or you could do key value like this. It doesn't matter how you do it. And you say in uh, my dicts dot items, you can then pull those out one by one. And so in this case, uh, we, we can go through here and we can say prints. This is my key. Now I'm going to show you what I would consider the best way to to do print statements when you have a, a, val a value you want to put in and, and display. In Python, they have something called f strings. And all this means is that you can, if you put an f at the beginning, you can actually put a variable inside and it'll just print it out. And so it's a great way to print things out. In Python, this is my key. 
and then I can put a statement below and we can say <clears throat> f this is my value like that <clears throat> and we go through here and we say value perfect and there we go we can see that we were able to loop through pull the first thing out the first key and then put the, the value of that key the second key uh, and then go through and, and and print that out now you can do the same thing as well with the the list we had so if we go back up here we can also loop over list and remember we had the my list a very simple list but we can we can do that as well so we can say four values uh, or we could say four items make the loop variable different in uh, my list we can just say print this is the value in the list and uh, we can go ahead and put this as a loop variable items just like that really so this is i would say i'm a, a fan of minimalism so what's the smallest possible thing to know in order to be you know competent at something or at least get started with something and i would say with python this is this would be pretty close i mean there may be a couple things missing but if you know how to print things out you know how to um, make a variable and you know how to create a list and a dictionary and loop you can do a lot you you can you can potentially start really learning python very quickly and and this is what i would recommend when you're when you're when you're getting started with python is to master these things so now that we've got these statements though can we do a little bit more uh you know with them uh, so i think the next thing that I I i'm going to do is i'm going to shift here i'm going to i'm going to push this into uh, our, our repo here we'll say save a copy in github so other people can get access to it and then i'm going to toggle to writing statements in a more of a programmer type environment so this is a, kind of a good academic environment and i use it all the time myself to, to build things but a lot of times when you're building code out you you want to actually write statements so you can write a script and so the next logical thing to do would be okay let's let's actually learn a little bit about how to structure a software engineering pro project uh, from zero so the first thing that i would say would be we need to get some kind of development environment and so what you could do is if you have access to github code spaces this would be this is what i'm going to do uh, i'm going to go ahead and, and launch github code spaces you could also launch visual studio you could um, check this out into a cloud environment there's tons of different ways to to write code just for ease of use for me personally because i'm in a browser-based environment i'm going to launch a github code spaces it should work very similar though in any cloud-based development environment or even your local desktop uh, i'm going to go through here i'm going to find my code spaces i use these so much that uh, a lot of times will need to delete one of my old code spaces so i can launch a new one <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna go ahead here and uh, share this this uh, environment for you. So give me give me a second. Okay, here we go. So we've got we've got this uh, GitHub repo back here. I'm gonna click on this code button, and I'm gonna say new GitHub code hmm, spaces. I don't know that. <clears throat> I'm gonna go new new GitHub code spaces. Here we go, and let's let this thing build out. There we go. So when you when you first launch GitHub Code Spaces, you get this kind of an environment, and so in a way, it's kind of equivalent to to the Colab environment, but it's for it's a little more software engineering focus. And the reason I want to show you this is that it is uh, nice for starting to to think about things in a in a software de development uh, way. I'm going to change the color theme here real quick to to visual studio mode so we can get it darker and then i'm going to go over to this section here and say terminal and say new terminal so the first thing to to be aware of and i'll make this a little bit bigger there we go is that what what i would recommend is that uh we'll go ahead and close this <clears throat> 
delete this here. What, what I would recommend is when you first get started with a project is to create a scaffold so that you're able to, to um, have some, some structure for making sure your code works. And this is, I think, sometimes easy to, to lose sight of when you're first learning to program. Uh, but ultimately, as you get more and more sophisticated as a programmer, it's important to be able to uh, reproduce your code and share it with other people. And then you yourself, if you come back to something, you, you, you're able to actually test your code out. And so what we're gonna do here first is I'm just gonna write a hello world inside of here. Let's just keep things really simple. And so I can use the command touch, which is this command, touch, and I can type in hello.py. And that's a way of just making an empty file in, in Python. You could go through here and say file, new file, but I find it easier to just use the word touch. If I go to that file now, we can use some of those things that we just talked about. In fact, we can just build a, a hello world Python script. Let's go ahead and do it. Let's just put in uh, a print statement right here and we'll just say hello world. There we go. And so this would be the, the difference between the, the Jupyter slash Colab environment and this is that I'm doing statements again, but I'm running those statements uh, as a script, which is what programmers do. So how would you execute this uh, hello.py? Just go through here. Just go ahead and say Python hello. Return, we see hello world. So it's actually very straightforward to build out a hello world uh, script in, in Python. Now, what if we wanted to implement all of the things that we, we did earlier? Well, that's pretty easy as well. Uh, let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to build one more script and we'll call this uh, my statements. So we'll go ahead and say touch and we'll say uh, my uh, statements here dot py. So we've got a my statements file. And then let's go ahead and just make it a little more complicated. Let's put uh, a list in here. So we'll say my list and we'll just put, we'll put some different things in this list. Let, let's not be boring. Let's, let's put fruit in there, uh, apple, uh, cherry, and uh, maybe like a, a lemon. There we go, apple, cherry, lemon. <clears throat> and then uh, I also could put a dictionary. We can say my dic dictionary. And maybe we can put in uh, so something else like drinks. We can say uh, coffee. I'm sorry, in, in my dictionary, we'll, we'll do an actual dictionary. We'll, we'll say uh, a uh, drink and we'll say uh, coffee and we'll say uh, milk and we can say whole milk. There we go. So we have a, we have a couple couple different things here, and then I could I could do what I did earlier, right? I could I could start to 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 use these things, and I could say uh, for uh, item in my list right here, my list, and I could I can loop through this, and I can say uh, something like with an f string, and I can go uh, my favorite thing to eat is and then i can put in uh an item inside of here so it, so what i would recommend when you're when you're starting to build out a, a program and you're and you're putting them into into scripts like this is to maybe first start with just a little bit before you get too 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 advanced with it and just test it out so we can do this we can test it out we can just type in uh, python uh, my statements and say my favorite thing to eat is apple right okay that's good enough i mean the, the grammar is a little rough, but it, it, it looks pretty good, pretty good. And then I could say something like, you know, for uh, <clears throat> the uh, key value in my dict here, you could do something like this. You could say uh, my favorite uh, thing to drink is and then we, we, we don't necessarily have to, to use the, um, the key and the value. One of the things that you can do in Python is that you can actually throw away the part you don't need in the loop variable. So I can just do this. I can put an underscore like that. And what's nice about it is it says, look, I don't need the key part of this. I can just do 
the value only. And um, I'll just go ahead and put this variable inside and we can go through here and say uh, value right there. Okay, and then we can run it again. And let's go ahead and say Python my statements. Uh-oh, we have a problem because I didn't do dot item. So that's again, what's nice about the, the iterative style of developing is you can see the problems as they develop here, which is kind of similar to the collab notebook. We can say items go through here and uh, there we go. We have my favorite thing to eat is apple, cherry, lemon. My favorite thing to drink is coffee hole. So, so we got something that's working here. So this would really be, I would say the basics of, of building uh, a script, but there's a few things to be aware of that I've glossed over. And I think the first thing would be that uh, we don't have a way of testing our code as a software engineer would test their code. And so my recommendation would be we need to, to build out a structure to catch bugs before they happen. So here's a, here's a really easy bug that happens a lot and that we can catch if we build out a project structure. So if I wanted to go through here and say, for example, my dict is equal to my dict like this, what does that mean? It doesn't, it's actually, I'm taking something I already did and I'm making it, making a copy of it and assigning it to a self, not really useful, right? There's no, there's no reason to do this, but it's, it's syn syntactically, it would work, but it could potentially cause a problem in the future. So that, this would be like a syntax bug. I also could create a bug like this, where I could go and I could say my list equals, and I could just kind of leave or my list two or something like this, and I could just forget to fill it out. And now look what happens. It just blows up, right? Invalid, invalid syntax. So in both of these scenarios, these, these potentially could be issues. I'll comment them out that it, it would be great if we could check them automatically. As you start to build more sophisticated systems, these, these things start to become an issue, right? Uh, and so what we can do in this particular scenario is build out a structure that can catch these kinds of things. So the first thing that I'll do is I'm gonna check this code in so that you have access to it. We'll go here and say git. Um, so I'm gonna go back into this terminal here and we'll say git add star. Now, what's nice about the git ignore file when you're creating a project is that this ignores things that you don't want to push into a Python project. And what's great about it is that I can now do git add star. And what this means is it'll just take everything in my project and add it, uh, which is really convenient. And now if I type in git status, it, it'll show me that, oh great, the two files that I wrote, they're gonna be here for me. I can go ahead and push them in. And so I can just do a commit message. We'll go git commit adding files to repo like this, I can then do git push. There we go. And, and, and now that I've got that pushed, uh, I could go back to the, to, to the repo and, and take a look at it and, and kind of toggle back and forth. In fact, let's do that. I'm gonna go here. I'm gonna say, go to repository. Let's take a look at it. There we go. You can see there, there's my hello. I've got that statement. I've got my statements here. Right, and I still even have the, the uh, Jupyter Notebook file or the CoLab Notebook file that I created earlier. So we're building all kinds of great stuff. And if I wanna open it back up again, I can go here and I can toggle back to this. So we're, we're, we're making lots of great progress, but as I mentioned before, one of the issues with, with building a project outside of just learning Python is that if you want it to be reproducible, uh, it's a important thing to create a structure that allow, allows your code to be easily testable so that you can do things like de essentially DevOps. And what DevOps is, is it's the process of continuously improving your code and continuously taking that code and pushing it into production. Like if you're building a backend web service or a machine learning application. So in order for us to do this, we need to, um, slowly build out a little bit of structure in our project. I call this the Python uh, scaffolding. And really the, the, the three files that you need when you get started uh, would be a make file, 
and uh, a test file and a requirements file. So I'm going to go ahead and build these out real quick so that we can we can have uh, testing in our project. I'll, I'll create this make file. So I'll say touch make file. One thing to note is that make files only work on Linux or Mac systems. That's again why I would recommend people use a, a like a, a web based development environment if possible, because it does solve a lot of problems. If I go through here and I say, you know, touch make file, we've got that. This is this is where I would run commands that will be helpful later uh, as we as we build things out. The other thing that I would build would be a requirements file. So we can go through here and do requirements dot txt. And then the other thing that I can build is some kind of a test file. So I'll go ahead and I'll say test and let's do uh, test hello. That would be a good one to, to, to build out. Okay, great. We've got those three files. That's pretty much all I would need in order to build something out. The other thing that I typically will do is if I have some, some stuff from another project, I'll typically use that as a way to get started. And so I'm in another browser window. I'm going to grab uh, something that I have from another project and just paste it into to this to just move move things along. So this make file here, uh, it, I, literally I could cut and paste this for every project that I work on. But the idea here would be any software I need to install, like libraries, like if I wanted to write a web a web service, which we'll do later later today, or if I want to install the linting software or testing software or a machine learning framework or, or whatever it is I need to do, I would I would do this install. I just type in make install. If I want to test my code, I would type in make test and it runs a command that's annoying to type out. And if I want to format my code, I can use this formatting tool. And if I want to lint my code, I can do a, a lint uh, command right here. So what's nice about this <laughs> is that all, all I need to do, in fact, if we want to be really uh, fancy here we could say any python file let's go ahead and lint it uh, and that's it that's that's pretty good pretty good setup here the other thing that i'm going to need to do is build out a requirements file and so i'm going to go ahead and grab a few files or uh, import statements or that that i typically would use uh, would be or packages pylint pytest and, and black that's a formatting tool uh, once i've got this set up i can just type in make install and so we'll go through here we'll type in make install and this will give us uh, an installation which will allow us to lint our code and test our code okay great we've got this uh we've got this working here so notice that what i say here is i say python disable the two warnings that are are uh, these are recommend recommended uh, warnings and configuration warnings. I just want to look at errors and standard warnings with pylint, and that's what this command does. So uh, what I'm going to do is just type in make lint, and this will check all of our Python files, right? Because we have two, and it says, "Oh, great, they're all perfect," which is which is great. But let's go ahead and let's uncomment this, right? Which, which we, I talked about earlier is a, would be something that if you're a beginner to Python, it'd be easy to make a mistake like this. Well, well, how does PyLint help us? Well, if I run make lint again, aha, look what it tells us. It says, listen, you're not supposed to do this. You're assigning the same variable to itself. That's, a, that's something I would re not recommend that you do. And so this is a great way to essentially become a better developer in the, f the instant that you start developing code is just do, do, do linting to your code. And so now I can just fix it. Now also it can check as well. It can check uh, actual bugs in your code. So if we go through here and we type in make lint, look, it also says, look, you can't do that. That's an in invalid syntax, right? So it really is helpful. I would say all professional software engineers that I know use some kind of linting with, with, their, with their projects. It's just uh, gonna, gonna make you more productive. And so a lot of times when you're learning Python, it's easy to get overwhelmed because you feel like you're the only one that's struggling. But the problem often is you're just not using the right tools. The linting just makes things a lot easier for you so you don't have to constantly be doing extra work. And that's really one of the things I think that's a, an important thing to consider. Sometimes when you feel like you're struggling or you're, you're barely you know above water, 
it's because you're not using the right tools that the experts are using. In this case, this would be one of those tools. The other thing we can do is we can also test logic in our code. So let's go ahead and change this hello world and make it a little bit more tricky. Not, not too much, but let's just make a, let's make a, um, a function, which I'll exp we'll get into after we take a break. But just for the, the getting started here, I'm going to, I'm going to build a function here and I'll explain it after we go on a break, but I'm going to add two numbers together, uh, right here. <laughs> there we go. And if I go through here and I, I print, uh, X, I print add and we do two and two like this. This sh we can just do a, a run this, make sure it works. There we go. Th this prints four. So, how would I test the logic of this? Uh, all I would need to do is go to this test file here and say from my from hello import add and this this uh, testing library allows us to actually programmatically execute the code. So we also can test that the logic works because the, the linting will only check the syntax. This will check that the logic works in our code. And so I would just go through here and I would say def test add. And we just say assert that two is equal to, this is the equality operator, is equal to add one and one. And does that work? How would we know? Well, we can go to our make file and we can just say make test. And it look, it says right here, test hello. So let's go ahead and do this. We'll say make test. And it says, uh oh, we have some kind of a problem here. So what's, I don't know what that is. That must be some kind of uh, testing module error. Uh, maybe we don't care about, about, uh, about pylint, <laughs> then we, we can we can uh, we can skip the pylint for now. Uh, I don't, I'm not I've never seen that error before. There's some kind of installation error, but the 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 syntax that's important to know about is. And I'll just comment it out. We'll just do that. We'll, we'll just say for now we won't run the the pylint. But basically the idea here is that you also need to test the logic of your project. Once I've got all that together, uh, all I need to do to share this project with somebody else is I just need to type in make all just like this. And we say make all and it goes through, it pulls the packages down. We do the lint and we do the test and then we're good to go. And so now uh, I'm gonna go ahead and say get status and say get add star and we'll go ahead and commit this code, adding code to repo. And so this, it is nice, right? That, that you can you can always come back, like maybe a month later, you're working on a project and you wanna make sure that it works. You just go through here and you just say make all, right? And it installs libraries, it lints it. That, that, that is very helpful. It, it really is a, a time saver. And as I'm teaching people to program, that's one of the most common things I find is that people are working way too hard and they don't have some kind of a test system like, like this. And once you have this set up, I would say you're going to be 10 times more productive. Now we're, we're not fully utilizing all of the power though of testing. And so what I'm going to do, the last thing I'll do before I take a break is I'm going to show you how, if we go back to GitHub, we can get even more, uh, uh, power, f f you know, for our, for our project to help us by using a continuous integration server. GitHub has one called Actions. I'm gonna go ahead and click on Actions. And you can see here, it's a very popular service. You can do all kinds of really sophisticated things with it, like deploy applications and do security analysis and all kinds of really neat things. We're not gonna do anything complicated. We're, we're gonna do something very simple, which is we're going to just create a basic uh, configuration file here that, that does the same thing I was doing locally. That's, that's all that we're gonna do. So. I'm going to go back here and I'm going to grab a previous one that I'd already set up just to go quickly. And I'm going to, I'm going to put this into, uh, our project. So let's go here and go ahead and do this and say, start commit. And now what that does by, by initially kind of triggering this is that it will tell the GitHub action system to go through and build out uh, an initial 
build of our project and we can watch it run. So it's going to do everything I did locally, right? It's going to say installation. Um, it's going to go lint and there we go. We have a, a perfect uh, build and I can click on this three icon. I think it's called a hamburger menu. Click on this thing, say create status badge, copy it. And then I could put it into our project. And then now we have the ability to know that our, our project works. That's it. So this is a great kind of checkpoint here for this because I can now share this with other people on my team or somebody at university that I'm studying with or, or whatever. We know our project works. You can, you can clone it. This concept, the, the reason why it's so important is that every time I make changes now, it'll, it'll programmatically run. So let's, let's, let's just show this real quick. If I wanted to go through here and I, and I, let's say I, I can even edit it from right here. Let's say I break this. I, let's say I go through here and I don't know, I add like at the bottom var equals, like I just make some bad code. Let's see what's going to happen is our system here. Our, our little robot will run it again because we made a change and it will fail because the lint won't work. The lint won't work because uh, that is uh, invalid code. So the syntax itself will just will, will fail. And here we go. We installed the dependencies. <clears throat> Aha, there we go. Linting does not work right here. Module hello. There we go. Cannot import hello, right? So this is the, the, the great part of setting up continuous integration, especially again, if you're a beginner, it seems like you don't need this if you're starting to, to build code. But as an expert, I would say you do need this because it'll make it so much easier for you going forward. Now to fix it pretty easy for us to fix. We just go back to hello and we, and we fix this, right? We just comment this out and uh, let's go ahead and, and build this, build this code and watch it run. And we go here and we see that now it should be able to pass. Install dependencies, lint it. Great. Everything, everything works. So this is a great checkpoint, I think, to, to, you know, if in a little bit under an hour, what I would recommend someone learning Python knows, know a little bit about a notebook, know a little bit about a project structure, build out some kind of a continuous integration environment. And again, it seems like it's, uh, why did I have to set up this stuff? You know, it's extra files and all this, but basically what we're doing is we're, we're, we're investing in the future. It's like a retirement account. We're, we're, we're putting money away now that will benefit us for the rest of our project. And, and, and this is really the, the reason for, for setting this up. So, so the, the idea with a function is that it's a building block, right? And so it, you can think of this as, the, as really the, the center of a lot of things in, in, in Python. And once you understand functions, really the sky's the limit. You can go through and you can do cloud computing is, is pretty easy uh, with, a, with a function. You can also do um, pandas because pandas, you can actually write uh, a function to manipulate the whole data structure in pandas and every single row, you could do some kind of operation to it. Uh, you can also do command line tools, which we'll get into uh, in a little bit. You can also do web services uh, and you can also do GPU programming. So really a function, once you know a function, you're, you're effectively able to do pretty much anything you want. And the other thing to be aware of with functions is that in many cases, they're, they're optimal versus object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming works great for GUIs. So when I'm doing Swift development, for example, or Objective-C or something like that, I would uh, like to use the object-oriented uh, capabilities to, 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 to do a lot of um, code reuse. But if I'm going to build uh, maybe web-based things, functional programming often is really the best, the, the, the best strategy. Uh, so that's something to consider when you're, when, you're, when you're using functions is 
that it really is the building block for a lot of things. So let's let's dive into that and, and start to, to use some functions and then start to turn them into to different things. So I'm gonna go back to this uh, repo and launch our code space again here and click on this. The, the reason I like code space is that um, it's very convenient if you work a lot with GitHub, uh, but as we mentioned earlier, there's lots of these kind of cloud-based development environments. Okay, so to start with here, I'm gonna go through here and go back, I have a terminal down here. <clears throat> now, one thing that we haven't done yet that often is a good idea is that is is that I like to use a Python virtual environment because it does protect me from weird errors. Like that error that I had with PyLint uh, or PyTest, I'm pretty sure it's because I didn't have a, a virtual environment in Python. So I'm gonna go ahead and set this up. So the way you would do that is you you could type in virtual env or python 3-env, env. They both, you know, depending on what platform will, will work. And then I do this, I do dot v e n v. I like to put it in my home directory. And the idea, like why would I care about this, is that I can actually have all my packages in a certain directory and I don't have to worry about what was globally installed on my system. It can cause very subtle weird errors. So let's go through here and uh, and do this. And, and I can say source dot v e n v and activate, just like that. And once I have this, notice that watch, if I type in pylint, uh, where I type, they, they may work, but it, it, it basically allows me to separately install just in inside of this repository. Now, what I typically do as well is that I will, if I say uh, which Python, I like to check and double check that, oh, okay, good. It's this Python that's inside of the virtual environment. So it, it basically separates everything into this particular directory. And then the other thing I do is I take this command and I put it inside of my bash RC file. So I go through here and I go to bash RC and I drop it inside and we say um, create uh, a virtual or, or source virtual environment. And so now every time source virtual env every time i use this i don't have to worry about it any shell that i open in this environment will work so let's go ahead and, and try that out so if i open up a new shell here look this this is sourced and i don't have to worry about it always kind of a good idea to in my opinion to to do that so i'm going to close that shell now i'm going to do make install again and let's see if that fixes our 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 pi test problem i think it will so it'll upgrade our, our um, Python package installation tool, install some libraries, and let's see if does PyTest work? If I run it, it looks like it does. Let's see if I uncomment this, if this works. Now if I type in make test, there we go. So that was the problem, right? So if you don't use PyLint, you get these very weird subtle problems that, that crop up. And so I'm gonna go ahead and add that change, get status, get add, make file, and we'll say adding testing. Now we got testing and we're ready to build out functions. So to, to I'll do a get pull to get those upstream changes, uh, which I, I just, anytime with git, I just tell, it'll tell me a message, I just, I just put, what they tell me in, I pull this, we can merge it. There we go. And now I can do a git push. <clears throat> so let's go into a function here now next. I think the best place to, to, to build a function out to start with here would be to kind of analyze this function here. Now notice with a function that it has the syntax of def right here and it has the, the word, which is the name of the function, and it has the parameters that go in. In this case, it would be X and a Y, and it has a return statement. So really, there, there is um, the, the structure of a function is typically that style, and 
you you have the the syntax you have the name of the function you have the inputs and you have a return statement now you don't have to do that though you can write functions that that basically don't return things you can write functions that don't accept things and, and uh, there, there are different styles of that so it's probably worth um, you know talking about that a little bit and showing you that and I, and I guess what I could do is I could go back to collab real quick and, um, and and show you show you that in that same uh, notebook so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, just toggle out of here for a second we'll come back to this and, and just go to the the collab notebook that I was working on and, or actually what we could do is just make a new one that's probably even better let's just make a new a new notebook and, and this one we'll call functions so I'll go ahead and say file new notebook and paste this in so you can see it there we go and we'll call this one functions and just a few key things here to be aware of first I'll I'll, I'll get it hooked into github so we'll, we'll keep track of it and this is repo as function from zero okay functions from zero there we go and that's been checked in and then I'm going to do the same thing I'm going to just go through here and uh, Let's open this up, make sure I've got everything. Okay, we're all set, it's all teed up. I'll go ahead and put a text block in and we'll just say the, the styles, styles of functions. So the styles here for functions would be, you could just do the simplest function possible, which would be def um, simple, and you do pass. That's that's the most simple function possible. It turns out it does nothing, right? The, the, all, all this does is just it's a it's an inline function here that does absolutely nothing. To make it a little bit like slightly more complex, we can do um, uh, we can do simple two, and we can make another function. This one will will not accept anything. Uh, and basically it will just do something right and we can just say like simple so you also can build a function like this and then to call it we, we can actually just uh, go here and say simple too and to call a function you just put the parentheses around it and and go ahead and run it there you go so so this is not really doing a ton of work but sometimes you do want to write a function that just has a bunch of logic and the reason for this would be maybe you want to just collect a bunch of work that does certain things and so uh, the idea here would be this just is some logic and just runs now the most useful kind of functions in my opinion typically are the ones that uh, will take some value do something and then return it back out and so this would be more of like we'll call this uh, let me make a, a text block here we'll call this like um, most useful function this would be the style that I would recommend is you say def and you have um, my my worker we'll just call a worker it takes some kind of a value maybe it takes the name of a fruit and then we put in whatever work we want to do inside of here and you could say like um, uh, maybe like a statement we could say statement and and that's what we're going to do and I could say uh, my favorite meal is chicken plus chicken and and I put in like a fruit right and we, and we and we do that statement and then i could i could just return it right so i could so that's the thing that's actually doing the work and then i could return back that statement in fact i could even put it into a data structure if we want to use a a dictionary we could say like my my um or we'll call this meals there we go that's a good name for it and we could say dinner and then we could put that inside of a, a dictionary like that and then I just go through and I return 
the meals, right? So this is a really good style, which is I put something in, I can always change the thing that goes inside this function. I do some work, in this case, it's a statement. I maybe put it into a data structure. In this case, it would be the dictionary, and then I return it back out. Now, why is this so important? This pattern is identical to the pattern if you're gonna build a command line tool, you're going to build a web service, you're gonna do machine learning, all, all these kind of patterns, you, you'll see them everywhere. And so this is why I would say this is the most useful style. So how do we use this function? Pretty easy to use. Uh, I can go through here and I can say meal, and I can call the my worker and just put in something. We'll call this uh, apple. There we go. And then now it captured that value inside of the meal. So all I need to do, first I can see what the type is in this particular scenario. Look, it's a dictionary, right? Because I, I created the dictionary here and then I returned back the dictionary. How do I get the value and do something with it? I just, I, in, in Jupyter at least, or, or Colab Notebook, I, I can just type it out. There we go, dinner. My favorite meal is chicken and apple, right? And, and then I could do whatever I needed to do with it, right? I could say meal dots, you know, keys, <laughs> Right, and I could I could see the the keys, or I could do the values, or, or or whatever. A lot of times, what you'll do with the result of a of a dictionary is you probably put into an, to a function, as you put into another function, right? And so I could have another function that maybe would you know do do some other thing with it. Like, in fact, let's do that. Let's let's go ahead and build another function that that accepts that function, and we'll we'll can say like, you know, um, human, right? And this one will take the it'll take um, food and then inside of here we can say um, basically we can just remember what the payload is like so it would be this I would say um, you know uh, we can go consume is equal to uh, food food uh, dinner like that and I could say return uh, consume <clears throat> and so now I could say here prints um, uh, I want my meal and then it will be and then I could just basically put put this all into a, a statement so I could I could basically do I could do this, I could put um, human, we'll say like my meal, like this, and then I could go through here and I could say um, human, and uh, we put meal in, inside of there. And then I can just put in the, the result of that into here. So we'll say my meal. Right there. So, so this would be kind of the style that, again, you would do is you would you would build. I want my meal. It will be my favorite meal as chicken and apple. It kind of a, the, the the grammar is not perfect, but the style is is perfect, which is that you you have a worker, it does something. You return back the results. You don't necessarily only do something inside. You want to return it so that you can pass it down to some other thing, which then does some other processing. And then you use the results of that. And so that, that is a really the classic style to kind of build things out uh, quickly. So let's go ahead and commit this and, and we'll put this into GitHub. And that's really the, the majority of what I would recommend is important to know about functions when you're first kind of learning Python and playing around. And it, and it, it enables us to kind of get to the next level here. Okay, we've, we've got this, I've checked it in, and I can go back to my GitHub code spaces environment here. Perfect, and I'm gonna go and launch my GitHub code spaces again. And I'm gonna go through, open up a terminal. Here we go. So now that we know that we have got some logic and we can kind of do, do some, some fun things here, well, well, what could we do uh, to build out uh, uh, something that's a little bit more fun. 
Well, I think a good thing to build out that would that would use that same style would be to to process you know some text from somewhere, maybe through an API, and and kind of combine things together. So, what I'm going to do next here is I'm going to write a we'll call this a um, wiki, a wiki bot uh, here. And what this code is going to do is it's going to call out into Wikipedia and it's going to grab a little bit of text from Wikipedia and then print it out. And so uh, what, what would we do? So the first thing, if I was going to play around with something like this, is I would first uh, put it into my requirements file, the library I'm going to use. So in this case, we say Wikipedia, uh, which I believe uh, is the name of the library that I'm going to use. I can look it up, though make install and this will install this Wikipedia library. Great. And now I go through here and I build out uh, a wiki bot. So we'll go through here and we'll say um, basically import Wikipedia, Wikipedia. And if I remember correctly, I think it's like Wikipedia. Actually, this is a good point that I'll that I'll show you here. Is I I like to to think in a different way, which is the IPython Jupyter way. And so I'm going to add a library called IPython, like this. And now, if I do a make install, we can actually kind of think in an interactive way. And so I'm going to play around with the code I'm going to write before I write it. And I do this all the time in order to interrogate an API or something like this. We'll go ahead and say import Wikipedia. There we go. And then the next thing that I will do is that I will say Wikipedia and, and I can just go, oh, look, I can see all the things that it can do. And look, it says summary. And if I do a question mark, I believe this will tell me what it accepts. So it says, ah, okay, you just put in the title and then how many sentences you want back. Okay, that looks pretty good. So uh, I think for, let's grab um, somebody I, I've used before. I think it's LeBron James, I think is, is uh, no. Let's do Google. Let's try that, that's an easy one. Let's do Google, does that work? Okay, what about Google lowercase? Does that work? Huh. Well, let's let's look at let's look at the Wikipedia library real quick. If you if you don't know how something works, in my case I don't know, <laughs> I'm going to to find it out. So we'll go to uh, Wikipedia Python. I'm gonna go look at the look at the uh, the library here and see what I'm screwing up. So yeah, I don't know why that some of the ones ones I was looking for didn't work out. Let's let's do theirs. Let's do a summary of Wikipedia. That looks like a good a good one. Um, or let's let's do let's do Facebook. Let's do that one. <clears throat> that looks like a good one. We'll go back here and. Um, Let's go back to my terminal and we'll open this thing up again. New terminal. I think I have one already running. Yeah. So let's, let's paste it in Wikipedia summary, Facebook sentences one. Okay. Facebook is a common web directory found at some American universities. Okay, great. Well, I wouldn't necessarily call it that. <laughs> I would say it's a lot, a lot different than uh, a university page. But let's go ahead and use it. We, we've got uh, Wikipedia s summary here. Uh, I'm not sure why it wouldn't also use other websites. Like, I guess we could say Wiki Wikipedia, Wikipedia. Does that work? Okay, great. We have Wikipedia, Wikipedia. What about um, uh, Microsoft? Microsoft, okay, great. Let's, let's do Microsoft. I, I like Microsoft. <clears throat> and. And what we can do is just go through and just put it into into the section here. And I can go back to my terminal, even leave that IPython window running, and just just test this out. Okay, here we go, Python Wikibot. And now it's not going to do anything because we didn't assign the results somewhere. So we'll say results, and then we'll say print results. 
Okay, so we're using the stuff we covered earlier. There we go, and we, and we have a statement. Now, this is okay, but it's hard-coded, right? So it's not useful, really, other than a hard-coded script. I mean, if you wanna write a hard-coded script, it's okay, but it's a lot more useful to write it into a function so I can do stuff with it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to build this into a function, and we can just call this scrape right here, and we can just say name. That, that would be our function, and then we just slightly restructure the, our code to, to basically not use Microsoft anymore, but we wanna use uh, the name. And, and then from here, uh, I could, if I wanted to, even change this to say length. And uh, in fact, in this particular uh, scenario, we could set a default value as well that's one one nice thing we could have we could have two default values we can actually have uh, microsoft here and then what's nice about this is i don't have to pass this in sentences i would just type in length right here right so we we've got some good things working in here and i would just return back the result and now i just change this to scrape and so what this should do is now we have a, a, a usable function here that we could we could build stuff off of. I'm gonna go ahead and say Python Wikibot. Uh-oh, I need to call it. That's the main thing, right? So let's go ahead and call it. And now we've got a function that, that calls into Microsoft. So it's pretty useful now because I don't have to always ask only for Microsoft's web page or, or, or Wikipedia results. I can ask for others. So if I want to go through here, and I think the other one we were looking at was uh, Facebook, and, and we can go through here and we can type in Facebook, and we see that we have we've got we've got Facebook uh, in there as well. So so it's kind of nice. We have a a useful, uh, and we say Wikipedia here. We've got a useful function that we can build over and over again. There are some limitations though to this, in that you don't want to go into your code and just basically re you know every time you want to make a change to it you change your code long term that's a bad strategy but in the short term because we're, we're we're going through this it's okay i think the next step though is that we need to write a, a unit test for this to ensure that it works so what i'm going to do is i'm going to go into this test hello uh, file here and I'm also going to import my other code. Now, I mean, probably actually it's better to create a new test file. Let's, let's create a new test file. So we'll call this uh, touch uh, test um, wikibot.py. And then I would go through here and I would say um, from wikibot import whatever the name is I had, which is scrape import scrape and then i could go through and i could build a, a, a unit test out we could say test and do scrape here <clears throat> and then i would say assert assert that the word microsoft is in the result that i that i that i send right because if i think if we, when we did microsoft let's take it yeah there we go microsoft is in here so I can just write a simple test that says assert Microsoft in and then scrape and do this, or no, scrape and then do Microsoft. Make, make sure that the word Microsoft appears when I scrape the Microsoft's website. Okay, that looks pretty good. So it's a pretty, pretty logical and simple style. All this does is it says look, look for this word inside of the output of of the, the scrape and let's go ahead and say make test and let's see if this works uh well we didn't test the uh, other file so that's the other thing to be aware of in our make file we should do test hello now if we want to be lazy we can do this i believe this will work yes it does work so basically it grabs anything with that um with that uh you know, regular expression. And so in this case, we say, oh, look, it passed. Now, if I change this test and I say, 
look for Facebook in the Microsoft search. We can look through here and it will will fail. Ah, no, that's not right. That, that didn't appear in the output. So this is a pretty nice little test here that we have. Uh, and I'll just uh, undo it and check it in. So so we've, we've made a lot of progress in that now we're able to use a, a function, kind of make logical code, build, build stuff into it. But we have some, as I mentioned before, some limitations to, to our code in that we need to, to parameterize it. And so this is where I would then go to the next step and I would start to build out a command line tool. So I'm gonna go through here and I'm gonna say, I'm gonna check this in. And say git add requirements, commit this, adding uh, a function. Let's go through here and uh, push this, do a git pull real quick, merge our code and then do a git push. And if we wanna go back to our repository, we can watch the test in action. You can see that that's, that's, what, this, um, that's what this little icon was. So we can watch it. And so it's gonna install dependencies. It's going to lint our code. Now it's gonna do the test because we enabled that functionality, which is pretty exciting. And then we're gonna go through and we see everything works, right? So we're, we're, we're on our way here. The next thing that we need to do to make this a kind of a realistic project and make the function more useful is to then use a command line tool. And what we're gonna use is a library called Click. So I'll again go back to our code space here and launch it. And, and then I'm gonna use the, the Click library. So I'll again open up a terminal and so in order to make click work, I'm just gonna look at the documentation for click real quick, or just kind of grab one of their little examples here um, and, and, and pick, pick that as an example. So I'll just throw this, keep working. I'll just throw this into uh, uh, maybe another file. That would be like, or even the readme, I guess I could put it into here just temporarily, just so I can take a look at it, the code, right? So this would be the, essentially the essence of what we would wanna do is build something like this out. So I, I, I could probably just copy this actually into our file and just manipulate it. So uh, I'll go here and just paste this in. So what, what do we wanna do? We wanna bring this import statement here like that. And then we also, uh, you, you, you also can go through here and, and swap this out. So let's, let's pull this function into our uh, click code, which is right here. And, um, and then if we wanna go through here uh, and um, uh, put in uh, this into a command line tool, all we need to do is just call this scrape right here. So this is that if under under name thing, right? Where it will only run this if it's run as a script. Uh, and then uh, I would change this to be name. So change, change this to be name. And this would be web page we wanna scrape. Web page we want to scrape like that. And we could prompt your like Wikipedia page, Wikipedia page to scrape. There we go. And that looks, I think this will work. So let's go ahead and try this out. And you can see here, the, the reason I like it is that you can just add this on top of it. And it, in my opinion, less code. That, that's why I like the, the click library. And so if I go through here and I type in Python, Wikibot, it should also uh, give me a, a help menu if I wanted to run help. So let's let's just show you that. There you go. Right. So pretty pretty neat actually. It, it shows us the, a help menu. It's like a real Unix utility. And and then from here, uh, I can type in 
dash dash name directly and just type in you know Microsoft for example and uh, in this case though we don't want to return the result we we would want to actually print the result so we would change things up a little bit here in that um, we, we we would want to we we would want to actually um, manipulate this a little bit and get rid of the return statement. And in fact, we can look at the click documentation. They have some fancy things here where they have this click echo. And so click echo, um, which I'll which I'll I'm going to bring in in a second, can can do uh, a, a for a, a formatting where it does a um, like a color syntax and in fact I have an example I'll grab in another screen and I'll, I'll pull over here so we'll go click and we can go here and I will grab this thing here we go click echo so click has a, a neat little thing like this so you say click echo click style and basically I can just say, you know, the result right here, which which we'll put inside of here, which will say result. So what's cool about this is look, it says foreground mode red. So I can make the text that I pull from uh, from the Wikipedia bot here, and we can make it we can make it red. So let's go ahead and do that. Pretty cool, right? Or blue, or white, or whatever. Maybe maybe white would be a good one, actually. A um, little little easier to read. Let's go ahead and try that. There we go. There's white text, or or we can make it blue text. We can make it whatever color we want. Uh, I think you can also make it uh, have like a highlight as well. Uh, blue is a little hard to read for me. I would say probably. Well, I guess we could we could make it fancier. So what I could do is I could look at uh, click their documentation, which I'll pull up here, and I'll just temporarily um, let's do this. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up their documentation, and we'll 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 find it. So let's go ahead and look at the documentation, and we can look for colors. And maybe make something that looks pretty cool maybe a little bit of because uh, I think it has a background yeah background so we can do a maybe like a background of white on blue maybe let's try that to a background of blue <clears throat> so I'll go back let's just grab a little bit of this text and then uh, I'll um, I'll put this into our code. So I need to put this in a buffer somewhere. There we go. And then I can grab this thing back, put this back into our screen here. <clears throat> so I'm gonna I'm gonna paste in something like this. It'll look it'll look I'll put a I guess I could put a comment or something like that in, in our code. Like that it's gonna and it's gonna look something like this so I'm gonna change it to be foreground will be blue but let's do the background white maybe that'll make it easier to read foreground is equal to white like that and then if I back open this terminal we can we can try it out so Python wikibot dash dash uh, name Microsoft so we missed something what am I missing here foreground foreground blue I don't I don't know why that is maybe maybe I have some kind of syntax bug but that's the least of my worries is making it fancy <laughs> so I'll just we'll just we'll we'll leave it here we'll leave it blue for now so but the but the the general idea here is that is that now i've got this building block piece of code that i can that i can pull things out and 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 you know essentially build off of now 
There is one thing that is a little bit bad about what I built is that I hard coded that function and in incorporated it into the this wiki bot. And so it makes it less useful if I wanted to build a library. So I think the next thing that we should do is build out a library instead of just hard coding all this logic inside of there. So how would we do this? Well, we can we can go through here and just start to build out this structure in, in Python so that we can also build web services and not just command line tools. So I'm gonna go ahead and make uh, a directory called mylib and I'm gonna create a, uh, a, a, a file inside called under under init uh, under under dot py and all this does is just tells python you can look inside of the under under init under under dot py file and uh and that will be something that you can you can import into and so what i will do is i'm going to take out essentially this piece of code and i'm going to put it into a into like a something called bot so i'll go ahead and, and create that so let's say my lib bot.py. And from here, we can just put this inside and we can go back to our statement that said return. And in fact, I can change my test to reflect, to, to reflect this. And so what we can do is um, even add a, a test inside of here that instead instead of wikibot we'll say my lib um, from my lib dot bot import scrape let's just double check does that look good and now let's go ahead and run our test so this is when you start re restructuring your code uh oh we say wikipedia is not defined we can kind of test out what's going to break so in this case we say import wikipedia there we go and if i run it again aha we've got it working so so we're we were fairly successful in pulling this into its own little project file right here and then i can now make this a little bit easier and it's more portable so what i can do is i can call this um potentially scrape scrape uh scraper or something like that uh, that might be too confusing. We'll just call this um, maybe CLI. There we go. We'll call this CLI. And then I'll go down here and I'll type in uh, CLI like, like that. <clears throat> and now uh, I can just say, instead of importing Wikipedia, I can just say from my lib dot, um, my lib dot bot import scrape. Right, and now this just makes it a little bit cleaner because I, I I can actually keep that code isolated here. And so this would just be scrape, and it's, this would be a little bit simpler like that. And then everything would look, uh, it, it would look, look similar. And so I believe that should work. And we say make test, does, does that work? And then in terms of uh, click, it also has its own testing library. And so what I can do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a test just for our command line tool so we can test that as well. Because if you go back to the make file here, this is gonna test all those files. So we, we could actually use a click based uh, test here as well. Uh, and so, uh, I can grab that real quick. I've got an example. I'm gonna go and build this out. Uh, let's see. Click test. Let me just grab it real quick. Testing click applications. Yeah. So it, the the testing looks a little bit like this. So so we can um, potentially put. Uh, a test down here so we can say from click testing import this test runner and uh, there we go and then we just say test and we and we we, we say the name of our, our file which would be in this case uh, wikibot 
So Wikibot, Wikibot, and we say, okay, let's go ahead and invoke it. How would we invoke it? We would invoke it with uh, scrape. We saw that earlier. And we would pass in, um, I believe we would pass in uh, dash dash name. And let, let me see, actually, I have a, I have a, I have a um, click, uh, I, have a, I have another example here of a, of a click test that I'll pull up real quick. In this user click cookbook, let's find our test recipe here. Click test CLI option. I need to find one where they have an option where they test. Ah, okay, yeah, so it, it's it's basically this. You, you just put in um, a quote like that, and then we would say Microsoft. Just like that, perfect. We say name Microsoft. We should say, okay, it should, it should um, be able to, to successfully test. And then also we could go through here and, and we could just assert that Microsoft is in the output. If this is successful, we will be we will be in business. We not only have a test for our library, but we also have a test for our command line tool. So let's go ahead and do this. So let's go ahead and say make test. And uh oh, we have we, we did something wrong, which is what did I do here? I given the command cleat out name function has no attribute name. Did we not, let's go look at our wiki bot real quick here. And, oh, it's because we called it CLI. <laughs> so it's correct. Our test is a failed test. So let's go through here and let's call this uh, CL, CLI. So, so we need to say um, from wiki bot import CLI, right? So this would import the piece of code that is gonna run our command line tool and let's go ahead and run it. And we're, we're better. So scrape got an unexpected keyword argument sentences, um, which we, oh, I see. So we need to change that code because we, we changed the way the structure of it works. And so uh, I can just slightly tweak this. If I go back to Wikibot, and, and notice that um, it has sentences here. We don't need to put in the sentences. Although, let's make our, our command line tool a little bit more useful, and let's just add that, right? Let's just add uh, uh, at click dot option, and then let's say um, length, and then we can do the, we, we can actually take this prompt out because I don't want it in the prompt in here. I want it to be, um, more concise, and then we could add a help option here for somebody to be, be helpful to them. <coughs> we can say this, we can say help, and say um, the, the length of the output from Wikipedia, like that. And then we would take this out, and we would also take this out. We, because um, we don't need to pass it in like that. And we could just pass that in. Perfect. Name, name, sentences, link. And so now if I do a, um, a test, I believe we'll, we'll need to pass in inside of this test also a, another parameter, which would be here, dash uh, sentences, and then put in one. Hopefully this will, will, will work. First try. Did you mean to pass in length? We did. Thank you. I did mean to pass that in. Did I not pass that in? Command invoke debug sync 
Now I don't, I don't know why that one is particularly causing a problem. I'm just so I don't get too caught up into into uh, boiling the ocean here. I'm just gonna put in one here and uh, just get, take this out, and then we won't pass that in, so I can get this working. There we go. And and let's just make sure it worked uh, by just running it. That's always a good idea. And so it expects. Uh, got unex scrape. Let's double check here. Scrape. Oh, because that's ah, that's the problem. That's why I had a problem before. Uh, is it it's it's it wants to pass in length. So let's see if I can fix this. Length, 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 and we can say length equals length. Now I see what the issue is. Length equals length. There we go. And let's go ahead and run this. And we can say, okay, we need to pass in name is equal to Microsoft and dash dash length is one. No, no option to find that the length is killing me. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to not use it and let's just get this working and go back to bot, double check that that looks good. We, we pass that in sentences link and we don't need that. There we go. Let's try it one more time. The see if this guy will work. There we go. We got we got it working again. So that's a good that's a good sign. If I do make test, the test we need to fix the this thing because we don't want to pass in the length anymore. And we, and we got our code working. So this hopefully shows how we let's see here Microsoft. Oh, we want to say not that the output is Microsoft. We just want to assert that. The output we want to assert that Microsoft is inside of the output, so we just need to change it a little bit, like our other test in. And let's go ahead and do that. Yay, we got everything passed <laughs> right. So, in my opinion, uh, the testing really saved us here. Even though I had a little bit of a issue with it, is that uh, it allows me to kind of debug something that could be potentially a little bit complex. So I'm going to go ahead and check this in. Get add star and uh, go ahead and commit this adding um, tests for CLI and go ahead and push this so what's, what's great again is that our build system will go through and and test this out for us now I, I did mention that I wanted to try out the fire tool as well which I've played around with before and uh, it is kind of an interesting concept this um, fire so let's go ahead and pull it up and say um, Python Fire uh, Library, and uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and show you in the docs why I think it's kind of a cool uh, function, uh, cool tool here. Is that um, if the, you can see the way this works, is that Python Fire is a library for automatically generating a chameleon tool. So, so it's it's probably the simplest possible way to build something. So for what we're building, this could be, uh, you know, amazing, right? And so uh, look at how it works. You just put, you build a function and then you just import fire. And then you say, if name under, under whatever, you say fire, fire. And, and, and then the fire will actually, uh, you know, load this up. So let's try it out. Let's, let's see if we can actually um, let's see if we can actually build this thing. So I'm going to copy that example and go back to our code space here. And um, what we can do is make a terminal here and make a different thing. We'll call this, um, let's say, like Fire CLI. Uh, let's try that Fire CLI. How about that? That looks pretty good for a name. And if I understand correctly the way that it works, I've only used it a couple of times, but you, you basically say import fire 
and then I believe we can say from my lib dot bot import scrape and we know that scrape if I remember correctly um, takes name and length and so I think we can just say this we can just do this we can say fire scrape that's it boy talk about a small amount of code if this actually works it's going to be amazing so we can go through here and we can say python fire cli dash dash help no module named fire okay well we didn't load it so i need to install it go to requirements go to fire all right let's do a make install Okay, that looks like it works. Uh, let's go back to our Fire CLI and let's run it. Woo, so it looks like it works. It found the name and it found the length, right? So pretty magical <laughs> command line tool here. Uh, so let's do it. Let's, let's do Fire CLI and we'll do name uh, Microsoft and then we'll do the um, the length, right? I think it was length one. Wow, that was pretty easy. So the world's easiest command line tool in Python is probably the fire library because, and this also shows why the structure of creating a library with a function inside of it allowed us to easily test two ideas out very simply. And so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna say get status and I'll go ahead and get add this commit this adding uh, fire uh, example and we'll go ahead and push this into production and then again go back to our repository and just make sure everything is loading uh, here and we can see here that uh, it looks like it's pushed and uh, we can we can go to actions and see uh oh there is some kind of a problem let's let's so we, we we should fix our problem here if there's still a failed test uh oh linting is bad oh bad indentation all kinds of problems well that's great right because and it also shows that there's a warning which can happen sometimes um when you're when you're building uh when you're building things with pylint and so, so this is now stuff that I can fix. So because I know that this is something that um, I don't know if I need to fix this because this is, I think, something that happens with Py, it's a um, click library issue with PyLint. But I'm going to copy this, um, this particular message first, and then we'll go back. So let's go back to our code space and let's fix these issues. Okay, let's go back into this. Now I should have actually run this, uh, but I should have done make lint and I would have seen this already. Right, there you go. So this is where the formatting tool really becomes uh, amazing. So if you remember, I created that, I haven't run it yet, but this formatting tool, let's do this. Let's do make format. And I believe it just will magically fix all that. So now if I type in make lint, there's going to be only one problem. There you go. So f the formatting tool is a nice secret weapon to have just kind of waiting around in your project. And then the next thing that we can do is that I can go to the actual make file here, which I'm in. And I can also say, you know what? I, I know that that particular warning I, I don't care about because it happens with click. And I'm going to say disable it. There we go. And I've tuned it. Now I've tuned my linter. There we go. We got everything working. And I can say make all, test the installation, test the linting, uh, also test the, the unit tests. Perfect, right? We've got everything cooking here. So we, we really have a fairly sophisticated project that we've been able to build really quickly, at least the start of one, uh, adding um, working code. Here, and we can say get add 
Right, because I, I changed all those, I reformatted them with the Python black tool. Uh, it's the, the git status will be different. And it should say that all of them are changed. Yep. And then we go and say git commit and it's fixing formatting issues. There we go. Get, get push. Perfect. And then now that it's been pushed, we can go into the uh, repository one more time. Check GitHub Actions. Make sure that we fixed our issues. And we should be in great shape. Maybe the first thing to start off with here would be to um, kind of decide what kind of web framework do we want to use. In my case, uh, I'm going to use the uh, fast API, which I have done some stuff with it recently. So I'll, I'll uh, pull it, it, pull it up. There we go. Let's, let's go ahead and um, ML flow. I was doing some machine learning code with fast API recently. So I'll, I'll grab an example uh, projects and just kind of uh, tweak it a little bit and, and, and show you how we could we could make our code work with it. So I'll, I'll, I'll call this one um, main.py. We'll go ahead and call this main. And then inside of here, I'm going to paste a bunch of code and we'll just re reduce the stuff we don't want out of here. So the, the first thing is um, just to show you an example of the kind of stuff you could build, this was a project that uh, I'll give you a copy of it. Maybe I'll do a live training on it in the future. Uh, this is a um, using Databricks. I built uh, something for MLflow uh, around this. So this is like a, a complete machine learning microservice uh, uh, framework. And I pull a model in from a uh, machine learning system and then build a microservice. We're not going to do that. We're going to keep it really simple. But basically, the stuff that I care about is is I, I probably care about... Uh, the UV corn, which is the web server, and then I care about the fast API stuff. And so I'll go ahead and put this in here. So we'll kind of do this and I'll check this in in a second so you get access to it as well. And then with, um, uh, if, if I want to accept a JSON payload, which I think we do want to accept the JSON payload, then uh, I would need to build out some kind of a a model for it and so let me just kind of clean this up a little bit so we'll need to do fast api uh, instance here and so what this does is is it makes my fast api object so i can build out some kind of a, a, a an endpoint for it and so we can we can basically you know test this out pretty easily first by um you know by by basically testing one of these other routes and so i probably can just get rid of everything in here and the payload would just be the whatever whatever i would actually send into it and so this this particular class here would be what what is the thing I want to send in? And so instead of story, I'm going to call this um, uh, wiki. There we go. And so so the text here, instead of text, we would call this name. So basically, this would be like what web page I want to to send as a as a JSON payload. And so I would just change this to to wiki, right? Like this. And then I would say wiki uppercase. And so this just uses uh, this to later build out API documentation. And then um, I, all I need to do now is import things from my library. So I can say from my lib, right? Is that what I called it? My, my lib, from my lib dot, um, 
and let's look inside of here, my lib.bot import scrape. And so we can reuse all of our code. This should be pretty, pretty handy to, to reuse. <clears throat> and in particular, uh, we would just need to swap out the way that we, we called that, right? And so we know that uh, all we need to do is pass in the name. And let's just double check real quick. Let's look at the code. Yeah, I just need to pass in the name here. And uh, I can go back to my 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 um, main file here let's close a lot of these because it's confusing too many things open okay here we go we got main right here and i'm going to just uh, pass in the results would be the um scrape and then the the basically the 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 instance of the wiki right here if i if i remember correctly let me just double check here <clears throat> text yeah so so basically it would it would actually be let me just look here it would be wiki dot name Right, because this is this is a, a class, and so that attribute I would need to, to to pass that in right here. So we we could even be more precise, and we could just say name is equal to wiki name, right? And what's and, and what's nice about this is that we we then have the the text result here, and then I could actually create a, a payload, uh, which which would be our dictionary and then encode it and then send it back out again. So we could say this, we could say, you know, payload is equal to, and we could say um, uh, potentially the name or, or the, uh, yeah, the name that looks, that works or, or wiki name, that would be a good way, wiki name uh, or wiki, how about wiki page, wiki page, that's better, wiki page. And then I would just put in that result, right? Which would be the, the scraped result back. And then we can just send that payload back out to people. So these other ones, this would just be like, hello, hello functions like that. And then I, I like to build a, a, also like a really simple route when I'm prototyping something so I can test that anything works, right? Just so I can test the Swagger documentation. Uh, which we'll, I'll show you in a second. So that looks pretty good. I think we've got we've got our code written here. So what I can do is I can type in uh, make install because I'm going to need to install all of the the Flask stuff. So let me grab that real quick and put it inside of here. Or not? I mean Fast API, Fast API stuff. So we'll go here and we'll say Fast API. I think we need Pydantic as well. And then I think we need UV corn as well. UV corn, there you go. And uh, paste these in here. Whoops, paste these in. Okay, we got UV corn, Pydantic, Fast API. All the stuff is good. Let's go ahead and do a make install. Get this cooking. And this will install all the uh, Fast API code. Great. And if I go through here and I say uh, Python main, uh oh, it says base model is not defined. So I also need to import the base model. I didn't install that. And let's go ahead and do that. So that would be from Pydantic import base model. So we'll go ahead and do that. There we go. Python main. Okay, so this thing's running. Now, this is one of the really awesome things about these kind of cloud-based development environments is that they do let you test it out in a web browser. And so if I go through and I open it, um, now you can't see it, so I'm gonna change it temporarily so that you can see it. I can change the screen share and I'm gonna show you this share which would be right here. 
and you can see potentially yeah here we go we, we you should be able to see this function and uh what's what's nice about this uh is that um you can you can then go through and run the docs here right and so in particular what i can do is i can just say docs and then we have fast api opens up now the endpoint shouldn't be called predict uh so let me change that we'll call this uh i'm gonna i'm gonna change it on the fly and say wiki and uh, we'll call this scrape story i'm just going to change this behind the scenes here for you and uh, i can um, stop it and start it again and i believe it should be smart enough to just uh, wake back up again hopefully let's go ahead and hopefully this We'll just reload. If it if it doesn't, then I'm gonna I'm gonna start it back up one more time, and maybe open up a different. I'm gonna close this and and reopen it for you. Okay, here we go. We got it working. Chrome tab. Here we go. Hello functions. It, it should be working perfect. And then I can go through here and I can say docs. Perfect. And now here we go. The documentation, I can click on wiki, scrape story. Look, there we go, name string. I can try it out. And what's nice is I can just put the payload I want inside. So I can say Microsoft and does it work? Execute and it will give me the curl which is right here and the result there you go so we have a full functioning microservice with uh swagger documentation which is awesome right so this thing accepts now json payloads so if i wanted to for example um you know basically put some docs in i would i would copy this which is not a bad idea to to show people how to copy to talk to this so i'm going to uh basically switch back switch back to my other other repo here so let's let's i'm going to copy this and put it somewhere so i can use it and i'll be right back let me just use it just here okay that's good <clears throat> so i can i can just swap the terminal so i don't have to reshare again so i can go here this should work yeah, so we'll just go back to code spaces. So so great, we got we got we got something working here, which is amazing, and uh, and we were able to test it out. Now the next step here would be that you know can we actually get this running into a production based environment, and how would we do this? Well, I would say we can, and the best way to do it potentially would be to build a container first so that we can test that a container works. And then we also could put some documentation that I was gonna put that says how to call it, right? So in this case, um, if we do a git pull, let's pull all our changes, that looks good. We could say like, you know, to call uh, microservice, we could, we could, you know, use something like this bash like something like this something like this there we go so we got that documentation but we also could con could containerize this and the way to containerize it is fortunately not too bad we we can actually uh take a docker file <coughs> and uh and 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 create it right here so i'm going to go ahead and uh, i'm going to uh, touch a docker file <clears throat> so do this docker file and then if i paste this inside i'll show you a, a few things that i'll that i'll build here i'm going to take out a couple things i don't need i don't need model but 
basically I'm gonna use a Lambda container base image because I'm gonna deploy this to AWS in their cloud-based environment. I'm gonna make an application. I'm gonna copy the uh, file into a application directory I'm then going to copy the requirements and then I'm going to install those requirements and I'm going to launch this thing. So uh, it's pretty straightforward actually to get the container working locally here. <clears throat> all, all I need to do is actually uh, go ahead and say um, docker build dot like that and this will build the container. Okay, <clears throat> it's downloading it locally here. And I could even put uh, some documentation about how I did this as well into our README file. So, so we'll do this. We'll say containerize it, build container. And I think it was just uh, Docker build dot and then to to know what the image was you can say docker image ls there we go you can see that that's the image right here so to build container and we'll put a documentation here right there and then to actually um, verify it um, and run it all we would need to do is just put in a command here that I can just get real quick, <clears throat> which would be this docker run and uh, put the image ID inside this. There we go. And in this case, the address is already in use because I had, I believe, something running already uh, in foreground mode. And now if I run it again, we might have to just kill a process. Let's do that. PS-EF grep Python. Sometimes you have to do this. You have to kill a process. So this process is like running somewhere. I don't know where it is, but I can just kill it. I can just say kill dash nine and kill this process. Now there's no Python running. Now if I run Docker, there we go. Uh, in this case, it says no module name my lib. So this is great because this shows one of the things that happens when you build containers is that you uh, potentially need to copy more things into the container. So in my case, I can fix this because I can just copy that inside of this location. And I'm gonna just add a little copy statement here. I'm gonna say copy my lib, my lib, and it's gonna go into my lib like this. There we go, I think that that should work. And then I'll go ahead and uh, rebuild docker build perfect now if I go through here again and I run this thing, well, that, that's the old one. So I, I need to find the new image ID, we, we would, which would be the latest one. So just go grab this ID and go here. There we go. So we, we um, have it working, which is a good, good news. And I can test it out more easily by just just curling it first. 
That way I don't have to go back and forth with web browser. So it looks like it's working. I, I would say we're, we're, that's pretty good. Now what we could do if we wanna get a little sophisticated here and not have to go back and forth between the browsers. If, if Remember, I had a uh, readme file here. I had the, the post command. So we can basically just uh, put this into a file and, uh, and, and make like a uh, basically a touch command that says uh, invoke.sh. And then I'll just paste this inside and I just have to tweak it a little bit, right? Because if you remember um, th that it takes this JSON payload. And so all I need to do is pull this out and I can put this in like that. We should just be able to do invoke it. And then I don't have to open up the web browser for now i can actually just test this out and so let's go ahead and do that let's type in bash invoke there we go pretty, pretty cool so i could put and i could test out different things as well i could test out um, wikipedia right which is another thing that we could test and uh perfect we're able to test our working web service i would go back to docker there we go we're making api calls things are Things are going great. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to stop this and I'm going to check all this code in. So go ahead and do that. And in fact, I should probably put this in the documentation, you know, build container Docker image, and then we'll say run container, run container like this. And we can type in history. So I get the command. Here we go. Something like this. I'll just type in something like this. And right, because the the ID would be different. And then we can say invoke, invoke, run, and we say invoke sh, invoke your post request like that. So this this would allow us to test the uh, post request. So, so great, we, we got all kinds of great stuff cooking here. And uh, I can do again, get status, get add, and, and, and push this into, into our repo, adding microservice. So we've, we've made, we've added uh, containerized microservice, containerized microservice. So we, we've, we've done a lot of stuff with the operationalizing these functions and putting them into, uh, a product now the the next thing we can do that's really really slick is we could now shift to the cloud and uh, in order to do that i'm going to just in this window right here just type in uh, i'm going to use the edibus cloud and we'll go to a console and uh, i'm going to use uh, a product called cloud nine and and cloud nine uh, is kind of nice because uh, it allows me to very easily work uh, and, and talk to AWS. So notice here I have a project called uh, Building Containers Already. Uh, it's a powerful machine. I'm just going to use that because it's it's close to me and I've got it available. And uh, in particular, we'll go into uh, functions. Um, from zero right here perfect and I'm going to just check this project out right here I'm going to check it out into this cloud-based development environment so it's, it's kind of similar right to to the other environment uh, and so I will need to check out the code I've already set up my SSH keys so I can I can just kind of move quickly here and just check this out now let's take a look at this repo though uh how would i run this locally well we, we should potentially deactivate the virtual environment that i'm currently in and i'm going to make i'm actually going to delete this one dot um because uh i want to create a new one and i'm going to just say python 3 dash m v e and v and make make a new one 
and then from here uh, I will I will go through and uh, and, and and source my bash RC which I have I think the virtual environment set up in there to, to, to look for it and so I have a new one now and I'm gonna say make install but I, I need to first change into my directory which is functions from zero or I'm gonna do make all so basically check out the the code install it lint it test it make sure everything's good that that's really the first step in, in a brand new environment great we're in great shape looking good so far awesome boy it always feels good all of our code passes okay the next thing we can do is um is actually now wire this into AWS's um, code repository. And so in order to do that, we're gonna have to toggle back and forth a little bit. And so uh, what, I'm, what I'm going to do is, um, is actually go, go, to, go to this environment that I've got set up here, that I can, which I can show to you. And so again, I, I checked it out into this environment and you can see that I've I've got it running. I did a make all. Every, everything's great. Now the the next thing that I'll need to do though is I'll I'll need to take the containerized application and push this containerized application into the environment that I want to want to work with. And so in order to do that, uh, I would need to talk to something called AWS ECR. And I'm gonna pull that up in another window and then I'll just paste it into this one. So we'll, we'll go ahead and say AWS console. And uh, here it is, log back in, ECR. Elastic Container Service, I'm sorry, Elastic Container Registry is what we want, ECR, ECR. A container Registry, perfect. Okay, and I'm gonna just paste it into this window and then we'll come back to this uh, environment here. So I need to keep this browser window kept around. Yep, this will work. Okay, let's grab this one. Okay, so we've got these private repositories set up here, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna create one. And I'm going to say in this particular example, let's um, create a uh, microservice, we'll call it a, a wiki, we'll call it a wiki repo. And here we go, we've created this, we've created this wiki repo. Now if I scroll down here, it's gonna give us these build commands or these push commands here. And so look, it's got all these really cool uh, push commands. Uh, now, what's nice about this is that I, I can just literally step-by-step step run these commands inside of here. So the best way for me to do this is I'm going to just copy all this and put this into a file somewhere that, um, that, allows, that allows us to uh, use it later and so uh, I can now go back to my other environments here and we can interact with this particular repo so perfect we got this going and so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, authenticate to this remote environment here we go and this basically just says hey I want to talk to the container registry then the next thing that I'm gonna do is I need to build a container locally. If you remember, we only built it inside of AWS, I'm sorry, into Google, yeah, I'm sorry, into GitHub code spaces. We only built GitHub, GitHub code spaces. If I go through here and I, and I paste this, there we go, Docker build, we can see that it will run here. This is why having a powerful machine is nice. If you are using a cloud-based environment, a, a more powerful machine would be great. So it, it gives you more capabilities perfect and then once this works assuming that it works the next thing that we would do would be we would tag it 
as the latest image or the the, the latest uh, build image yep and then we will go through and we will push this out here we go docker push and inside of this we could say docker push push this code into the repo now the reason why we want to push this into the container registry is that it allows us to easily then go and work with other microservice technologies on AWS to host our application. And so that's great, right? We have this thing pushed into a container registry. We were able to do it from a cloud-based environment inside of AWS. It was really fast to communicate. And so now all we need to do is, is move over to the um, AWS uh, service that I want to use to deploy this called App Runner. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and pull it up real quick, and just paste it in this window to App Runner. All right, let's go ahead and paste it in here. And so this this gives us this App Runner window, and I can say create new service like that. And here we go. Here's why the container registry is so important. And this is why it's kind of amazing. We just started with a function. We built up a command line tool. We built up a microservice. We containerized it. We pushed the containerized microservice into a Docker a container registry. And now we can link to it using this app runner service. And from here, we just need to tell it what is the container image URI. So enter a URI to an image you access or browse. We'll select this. We'll go through here, wiki. There we go. And we can continue this. And then now we can do automatic uh, container uh, deployment right here. We can also go through the access role. And then from here, we can actually uh, build in the, uh, the, the, the name of the service. So we'll call this uh, functions. Uh, function, we can actually call this function as a service, right? which is what we're building fast and then i just scroll down here and i just say next perfect and we can do create and deploy there we go function as a service now what's amazing about function as a service is that uh, it it allows us to very quickly take this and and containerize it uh, and put this into production uh, you know, there's a little bit of a gray area about what does really it mean to be function as a service. In some cases, it would be just a AWS Lambda function, but you could also make the argument that something like this that uses a container that it has a, a function wrapped in it could also be called function as a service. So what's happening now is it's, it's essentially ingesting that container file that we built and tested before in GitHub code spaces and then it's creating a microservice wrapper for it so that we have the HTTPS uh, location here. Uh, and in particular, uh, we could also see the, 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 um, the, the, the linkage, right, where this links into the, um, the container registry that we, we talked to before. In fact, I think if I just click on this, uh, yeah, it would, it, would, it would show me that that page uh, and then as the service is being uh, spun up this will actually go through here and show us all the different things uh, including the service creation the metrics you know like when it's running in production the actual configuration so where where's the container live um, also custom domains if i wanted to set up some kind of a, a, a custom domain here. So in, in this particular scenario here, we can see that the we're able to successfully create a pipeline for automatic deployments. Um, so it looks like we're pretty close. Let's go ahead and let this thing uh, flush out here. And, and what's really, really cool about all this is that all we'll need to do is click on this uh, URL when this is finally operational. <clears throat> and, and what that will do is it'll let us uh, 
play around with the microservice while it's actually um, hosted in a uh, AWS cloud. Let's give this thing just a little bit more time. It usually takes just a few minutes or so for, for, for the microservice to, to run. Okay. Let's let this thing get uh, flushed out here. Almost complete. Okay, looking good. Look, it says now that it's performing a health check. So that's the final spot, but we can see the, the, the operational uh, sequence. We go through here and we say operation in progress. It creates an auto deployment pipeline. So it means that every time a new container is pushed in, into there, it'll redeploy, which is pretty amazing. It pulls the image from the Elastic Container Registry. It provisions the instances and deploys them. And then it performs a health check. As soon as that health check is, is passed on port 8080, then we should be able to, to run. So it's close. Health check is successful. Now it's going to route traffic to the service through, through this encrypted uh, domain here, which is, which is really amazing. Let's go through here and let's uh, let this thing flush out. Almost done. <clears throat> there we go. Oh, it's set to running. That's a good sign. Here we go. So it should be active. So if I just copy this link in theory let me just test that out on another window real quick uh yeah i think we can do this let's let's go ahead and test it out you can see it's green now and there we go we we're, we're in here and in fact i can do docs like that there we go we're, we're back into our web scraper microservice we go to post it, we try it out, and we say this. We say Wikipedia, and let's go ahead and do an execute. There we go. It's all working perfectly. So what, in my opinion, what's awesome about this kind of a workflow is how uh, the, the kind of the breadcrumbs can be set where you're building a real world microservice really starting with just a statement and trying some ideas out, experimenting, building a project structure, and then later going through, building into a function, building into a command line tool to, to interact with it, then building it into a, a local microservice, then containerizing it, then using a service like this that does full continuous delivery. So you could potentially hand this off to a client and say, okay, we're good, here's your, here's your microservice that I've deployed.